the dad. Amen. Say it, Eric. Amen. Everybody tell Eric he's a child of God. Eric, you're a child of God. Amen. <laughs> Father, we come to you. Now as we open your word, we ask you that you might just guide us. We desperately need you, Lord. These are your words. This word is the living word. It's a word that we need in a time like this. And I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds this morning to the truth. The truth sets us free. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever watched Jeopardy? Yeah. Most of us have watched Jeopardy. I've got to tell you, it's amazing to me as I watch these uh, contestants on Jeopardy, how much trivia someone can have in one's mind. And now, I don't know if you guys are like me, but how many of you watch Jeopardy and sometimes you find it quite embarrassing that you didn't know very many answers? Anybody else like that? The rest of y'all that smart? That's why we don't watch it. I'm glad we have it all. And at the end of the day, you'll have that chance to use it. Occasionally when I've watched Jeopardy, I've recognized that the Bible is one of the categories that they will use on there. And, and I say that to you because I, I'm determined that the Bible is not just a trivia book. It's not just something that we should read for trivia so we would have knowledge. But it's something that we should read so we can apply to our lives truth. Can I get amen on that? Yeah. You guys are kind of quiet this morning. I'm not sure what that's all about, but I'll wake you up. You got your Bible strong in Luke 17. I want to start reading in verse 22. Stand with me as we read God's Word. I figure if I make you stand up, sit down, up, you won't go to sleep. <laughs> then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should, be, should go back for anything. And then verse 32, he says, Remember Lot's wife. You can be seated. So as we read in, in Luke 17, we find Jesus telling his disciples how quickly the Son of Man is going to come. And he says there will be very little, if any, warning when that time happens. How many of you have read some of the Tim LaHaye books, the Left Behind series books? Nobody? A few of us. Tim LaHaye warns of a rapture that will happen, and that this rapture will come with, without any warning. And I recognize that life is... We most, most of us have very routine lives, do we not? Most of us, you know, we, we have specific times that, that things we do in a given day. Most of us get up at the same time. We do the same things each and every day. We, we drive the same route to work. You know, I, I actually will go different ways just because I get bored going the same way every time. But most of us are very routine. We are very regimented in how we live our, our lives. And our lives don't vary much. Jesus said in Noah's day, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying and being given in marriage while Noah was building the ark. Well, you know, Noah went through a whole lot. Don't you know that? As he was building that boat. I, I thought, how many times did he make the 6 o'clock?
o'clock news. Mm -hmm. This nutcase over here building this big boat. Yeah. He's talking about rain. Nobody even knows what that even is. The scripture says, while Noah was hurting the animals onto the ark, this is modernizing. Somebody was sitting down at Starbucks getting ready to get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Others were getting ready for lunch. Some getting ready to go on a date, perhaps. Going through their daily routine, doing their daily chores. Some people were probably not in the world, but some were cutting their grass. <laughs> Others were out perhaps playing ball. And not as a trivia statement or question, Jesus says in verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Who? Lot's wife. What does Lot's wife have to do in this discussion of the second coming? And I think that's an important thing for us to address as the church. And as I read that this week, as I was spending time in the Scripture, I was thinking, well, what was Jesus trying to say to His disciples right here? And in fact, what is it He's trying to say to His church today? That would be us. And I want to share a few thoughts with you that the Lord has given me. Number one in your outline, in your bulletin, we have an outline. Number one is this. People haven't changed much through the years. Hey, people are still people. Not a whole lot has changed. It has been said, and I quote, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Unquote. Noah's day was characterized as, as how wicked man was. Could we not put today's date in there? When I look at how wicked we see in our culture has become, things, things were so bad back in Noah's day just, that the Lord was grieved that He had even created man. So I'm telling you, this was a bad time back in the Old Testament right here. Lot lived in a generation, one that was obsessed with sex and immorality. And several thousand years later, not a lot's changed. All you got to do is watch the news and see that not a lot has changed from, from Noah's day to Lot and Abraham's day to our day. We live in a society today that has, has become obsessed with sex and, and violence, homosexuality, sexual promiscuity. They're accepted as the norm in our culture today. Pornography is a multi-billion dollar business. It is estimated that up to 30 million people will log onto a computer and watch internet porn this week, of which, let me just, might, can I add, 10% of those will be church going people. And when you include the drive-by shootings, the gang activity, theft, mass murders, when you add in all the child abuse, it's easy to see that we live in a violent time. It's easy to see that we live in a sinful culture today. We have, we have uh, uh, progressed so much with technology. Uh, the scientific field has gone so far. The intellectual advances have been mighty. But boy... We have not progressed at all morally, have we? I remind you that Jesus said in both Noah and Lot's day, God brought judgment on the people as they were living their lives routinely. In fact, what does that mean? When they least expected it. Do you get that? Someone had just driven into Noah's Ark restaurant. Someone had just ordered a steak. Another person had just went to Walmart and purchased something. Another person has hit a, hit a baseball and he's, he's rounding the bases. Another guy might have just said, I do to his bride. All this was going on when the judgment of God happened like that. But in all this, it was business as usual. The second thought I have on this scripture today is this. Lot's wife was a product of her culture. She was a product of her culture. We, in fact, we know very little about Mrs. Lot. We don't, we don't know very much at all, but we know quite a bit about her husband. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. We all know who Abraham was, the father of the nation of Israel, a man who the scripture says walked with God, a man who God called his friend. And I've always thought that was interesting. Many of us want to call God our friend, but how many of us does He call His friend? 
I think that's more important than me calling God my friend. Back in Genesis 13, when Abraham returned from Egypt, the word tells us he did so as a very wealthy man. And we know that his nephew Lot followed him when he left. And, and Lot, from what I can discern, seems to be kind of a guy that had a free spirit. You guys know anybody like that? Just kind of, you know, took it as he came. Not, not very structured, just a very free-spirited guy. A guy who enjoyed the, the, the riches of his uncle. A guy who enjoyed uh, uh, having a rich... Anybody here got a rich uncle? You got one? Can you give me his name? I don't have one. I need one. I'll let this man adopt me. And most of us who have rich uncles, they don't want to talk to us. Because they're rich. And they're like, you're like a little leech. What are you going to do? <laughs> Lot enjoyed having a rich uncle. It's easy to see that. He, he enjoyed his material possessions. It's easy to see that as well. Anyway, so we can learn from Genesis 13 that because of the size of, of their, their, their flocks and, and because of the bickery that they had going on with their employees, that, that it came a time that Abraham and Lot had to go their, their own ways. Abraham, being the man of God that he was, he said, Lot, you take the pick. You go whichever way you want to go, and I'll go the other way. He gave him that choice. And Scripture tells us that Lot chose the good land, land where there was lots of water near the city of Sodom. Next thing you know, he pitches his tent nearby the city, a city that no doubt he knew had a very bad reputation. He chose to go that way and pitch his tent nearby. And originally, he didn't live in the city, but he pitched his tent, this is an important truth to catch, nearby that city. That got me to thinking, which is kind of scary. But I thought, I thought these, these thoughts in my mind this week. Do you think Lot might have been fascinated with the city life? You never ever gone to New York City and you see the lights and you find that could be pretty enticing, inviting, so to speak. Tented for sure. One day, I, I think he's probably got his tent, he's pitched outside the city, and one day some of the guys came along. They began to become friends and so on, and, and they invited him, hey, why don't you come in town? And I have no doubt in my mind, Lot thought, you know what, I can do that. I won't become like them. I can go in, I can make a difference. I can be a difference maker. I don't have to go in and thump them, you know, with the Torah. I don't need to do that right there. I can go in and, and, and not be too preachy. And then I can become friends with them. And as I, as I begin to become friends with them, then I can teach them truth about the one true God. I have no doubt that that was his, his intentions. And then the word says that shortly after he unpacks his boxes, uh, a king takes him hostage, a king who was battling war against the Sodomites. And then, and then you go to chapter 14, and Uncle Abraham comes back again and rescues him. Uncle Abraham was always coming to the rescue. And the word tells us that every night a one of his possessions was left. He, he got them all. Every bit of that back. And as I've studied this right here, a thought came to my mind. I thought, was God trying to give Lot a warning? He had pitched his tent nearby the city, taken hostage by the king, seeing right from wrong. And I thought, maybe God was trying to give him a warning. And, and I thought if he did, <clears throat> Lot missed it. He missed it totally. Any of you guys ever missed it before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a bunch of people lying in this room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The best thing Lot could have done was to have gotten away from Sodom as fast as he could. To have fled and went the other way when he realized the environment that he was getting into. The temptations, the, the lifestyle. And then something else hit me this week. Something I think might have changed Lot's life in a mighty way. You see, up until this moving into Sodom, I can't find any mention of Mrs. Lot. Not a woman. Nothing about her whatsoever. And it made me wonder something. I wonder if Lot, when he first pitched his tent nearby the city, I wonder if he was a bachelor then. On his own. And could it be, I don't know this for a fact, but could it be that once he pitched his tent 
And once he became friends with his buddies there, and he went to the city, could it be that somewhere, sometime, he married a pagan wife? A woman who did not know Jehovah God. Again, I don't, I don't know for sure, but perhaps she grew up in a city. And if she had grown up in a city, she would have known its wickedness. She would have known that it had no limits. I also thought about this. I think Abraham had a hint of what was going on with Lot. Because the Word says that while he was in the midst of all this perversion, Abraham was praying for his nephew. How many of us have prayed for those we love when we know they're in the midst of trouble? So anyways, in chapter 18, the Lord Himself and two angels appeared to Abraham. In the Old Testament, when Jesus came, before His incarnation, it was called a theophany. Coming in the Old Testament, Jesus Himself. And, and so the Lord is on His way to Sodom. He's got two angels. And the Lord tells Abraham that I'm going to destroy these two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of their wickedness, I'm going to place judgment upon them. And Abraham begins to plead for mercy. He said, Lord, if there's 50 righteous people within the city, would you spare them? How about 45? Or 40? Or 30? Or 20? Lord, if there's just 10 righteous people in the city, would you spare them? You catch that? Most theologians believe that Sodom was a city between 300,000 and 1 million people. So let's take the small end, 300,000 people, not 10 righteous people. Not 10 righteous people. And we think what we're going through today is something new. This has been going on since the beginning, since that first sin in the garden. And in chapter 19, we see the angels and, and they, they're approaching the city of Sodom right here and, and it says they find Lot sitting at the city gates. I was talking to the men's group the other night and why was he sitting at the city gates? See, you, you, you might kind of just gloss over this here quickly when you read that. And I thought, was he just sitting there having some, some coffee with his buddies? No, I don't think that's what it was. Most likely by this time, he has become the new leader of the city. Well, you see, the people who sat at the city gate back in that day were the prominent people. The people who had influence. The people who had power. The people who had money. And so here, Lot has gone from being nearby the city to not just living in the city. He's one of the leaders of the city. Do you see the progression that has happened in his life? Somewhere along the line, he moved into town. And I thought, when he saw the angels, I wonder what was going through his mind. I wonder if he thought, oh my, I'm busted. I wonder if he had any guilt going on when he saw these angels. Because the Word says that he called them lords. He, I don't know that he knew they were angels, but he knew they had power. And he, and he alludes to them as, as lords. And I thought, have you ever got caught by some, for, for doing something wrong? And how he'll get you? I bet you he was red-faced. Oh, boy. Boy, I made a mess of it. And anyway, the angels, you know, he invites them to go to his house. And, and it says they, they had supper. And after supper, they're getting ready for bed. And there's a knock at the door. And in verse 5, it says there was a mob there. And the mob says this. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to use so that we might have sex with them. The Bible says that Lot goes outside the door to try to solve the situation. And then in verse 7, listen to what he says. He says, No, my friends. Let me say it. You know, catch it, did you? Know my friends. Hmm. Don't do this. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man, although they are engaged. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. The key word here is friends. I mean, how can these guys be his friends? They're wanting to have sex with angels. What kind of friends did he have? Sick ones. Sick ones is right. You, you know what? You know, I find it shocking 
that he would say, these guys are in the protection of my house, but I'm going to send you out my virgin dog. What kind of daddy does that? What kind of dad says, I'm going to send out my virgin dog so you can have your way with them? What kind of man had he become by this time? And what about Mrs. Lot? Even if he was that bad, she should have smacked him on the head with a frying pan. Yes. What had happened to their moral standards? The scripture says that as the men of Sodom were trying to get in the door, the angels pulled Lot back in the house and says it made the men outside go blind. And then with a sense of urgency, I think, in judgment in verse 12, it says, the angel said, do you have anyone else who belongs to you? Get them out of the city. Then at dawn, verse 15 says, the angel said, hurry, take your wife and two daughters, or you will be swept away. Impending judgment was coming right here. And I thought about this. But they only have two angels. They, he knows these guys. Even if he doesn't recognize their angels, he knows they're very powerful. And they said, get your two daughters and your wife and get out of here. They wouldn't have to say it once. One time. There wouldn't be any conversation. I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's get out of here. Why would you hesitate? Why would you hesitate when you get a command like that? And I'll tell you, I know the reason why. It's because Lot did not want to leave everything. He had a whole lot right there. He had a lot of goods. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of power. He didn't want to let that go. What about Mrs. Lot? I can almost hear this woman saying, you remember Job? He lost everything. Then he, then he, I don't mean this in any way, ladies, but he had a nagging wife left. That's all he got left. <laughs> and what she said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? Yeah, that time I just said, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying what I say at that particular moment. And that's what that's what happened with Job. But what about right here? I can almost hear Mrs. Lott going, honey, no one else is leaving. Why should we? No, no one else is leaving. <coughs> Let me give you a truth. Most people will follow the crowd. We've seen that. Most people will follow the crowd, but God is looking for people who will not follow the crowd, but follow Him. And that isolates you. That puts you out there on an island by yourself. Because the crowd's not going to be with you. People who might, might love you won't even be with you. You will be alone. God will always be. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you is what it says. Amen. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and 17. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Can we say amen to that? Amen. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. So the angels grabbed his family, and they basically grabbed them out of the city. And in verse 17, the angel says, flee for your lives. There's a sense of urgency right here. If you're reading NIV, he's got an exclamation mark. That means you pay attention. Don't look back. Flee for your lives. Don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away again the second time of the warning. Can you imagine how chaotic this was at this time? The angels trying to get them going, trying to get them going the right way and so on. And in the middle of all this right here, I, this blows me away. In the middle of all this, Lot says, hey angel, can we go that way? That's what happens here. Let's flee. Hey, I'm going to go that way. That blows me away. And I even get more blown away. The angel of free. He's like, all right, let's do it. But don't look back. We'll go your way. But don't look back. You know anybody with a lot of patience? Do you? I'm so just talking to me. A lot of patience. This angel had a lot of patience. As I read this right here. And it says they were all headed toward the, the town of Zor and, and that they arrived just in time as the burning sulfur 
fell down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, what does all this have to do with Lot's wife? Just a thought. I, I wonder and I believe that Lot and his wife were unyoked. The Bible talks about being equally yoked. And I think they were unyoked. Again, I, I'm almost positive she was a native of Sodom and, 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 and probably was a, was a pagan. In all likelihood, she was a non-believer in God. And so that would make them unequally yoked. And you're thinking, what's the big deal? So a believer marries an unbeliever. So what? Well, God says, don't do that. You know, His Word's pretty important. And He says, don't do that. Young people, listen to me. He says, don't do that. Can I tell you, I've done lots of counseling with people because of just this unequally yoked. And then you're in the midst of it and you don't know how to get out of it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership. That's war. Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? I think not. I imagine, and I believe that Lot initially opposed the lifestyle of people that lived in the city of Sodom. I believe that when he left Abraham and went that way, I believe he was in opposition to that lifestyle. But I wonder if through time, his wife might have said, if you're going to get along in this city, you don't know this city. If you're going to get along in this city, you want to lighten up a little bit. If you're going to get along in this city, you can't be you can't take everybody so seriously. Hey, it's only a harmless little bit of sex. You're, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're too regimented. And I thought to myself, did Lot hear that so many times that somehow he lowered his principles, his values, his character? James says this, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's a pretty serious statement. That a friendship with the world means I'm an enemy of the Lord. That leads me to my third point. Mrs. Lot couldn't go forward when she looked backward. She could not go forward looking backwards. And, and, and at the insistence of the angels, these two angels, a lot, Mrs. Lot, his two unmarried daughters, they all, all left Sodom. And I wonder again, I thought, I wonder what was on their minds as they left the city that day. Again, Lot was quite wealthy, quite prominent. And now here they are pulling out of town with only the clothes on their back. You think about that. They have no photo albums. They have no food. They have no extra clothing. They, they got nothing. And now, as they're traveling on the way to Zor to the next city, as they're, they're about to approach the city, verse 26 says, Lot's wife looked back. Cool. Verse 26. It says when she looked back, she became a pillar of salt. Why did she do that? That was so dumb. Have you ever done something that you thought, that was just dumb? I remember one time, uh, years ago, uh, I was riding back out on, on my motorcycle, and I'm riding up the road. You sometimes just kind of get in a zone. Guys in the you know, and you just kind of get in that zone, you're riding. And sometimes when that happens, uh, you got to be careful. Because I'm riding it, and now I put my bike, and I'm just riding along, so I see a box in the middle of the road. I thought, like, I need to kick that out of the road. Oh. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want the next car to hit that. <laughs> that was stupid. That was stupid. That was stupid. Who said that? That was stupid. And Monica, surely you've never done anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that box was full of books. <laughs> And I kicked that box. The first thing that happened was my foot just about fell off. The second thing that happened, my foot said it had a signal to my brain that said, you are stupid. <laughs> and I apparently picked that bike up. 
Next thing I have my brother was behind me, he's just laughing. <laughs> As I would have been, the table would have been turned. Pastor Jim, you're talking about you thinking about kicking that out of the way. My brother was driving his truck one time down in the uh, residential section. There was a box in the road. And he could have just squashed it with his truck. And at the last minute, he decided, no, there might be something in our public tire. He gets past it, looks in the mirror, and a small child comes up out of that box. Oh, my gosh. Mm. And he had that. to pull off the road and get himself together. Mm, mm, mm. The grace of God. Amen. The grace of God. Picture a lot in this scene. He's trying to get his family away at this point. I think he's catching the urgency of it. And he looks over toward his wife and he's seeing her beginning to look back. And I just can imagine him going, No! And it was too late. She's done it. So close to being saved. She was so close. Think about it. She had had. She had that junk at that escort to take her out of the city. She, she, she had escaped the fire and the brimstone. She was almost there. Only to be turned into a pillar of salt. Because she looked back when she was told not to. We live in a time right now when so many people say, well, you know, that word is okay. Not for our time. I think she probably thought the same thing. Surely they're not serious when they say, I'll move back. Surely. No. What do you think she expected to see when she looked back? <coughs> this woman deliberately disobeyed the angels. They said, Don't look, and that's exactly what she did. What part of don't? Have you ever said this to your kids? Do you not understand? Was it curiosity? Was it was it pride? Maybe she thought, there's nothing going to happen. They have the angels with me. <coughs> well, here's what I here's what I can do. It's that her heart was still inside of her. Do you get it? That's where she still was at. That's where her heart was. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 26, <coughs> What good will it be for a man or a woman if he or she gains the whole world yet forfeits their soul? That's right. She broke one command. Don't look back. One command. And have you ever thought, because you know we live in this time of grace, and I believe in grace, and I think we manipulate grace in the church today. But did, did you ever have you ever thought about Lot's wife and thought, what if God didn't give her a break right here? Ever thought about that? Y'all don't think about that kind of stuff? Total plate or not? Total plate or not? Let's see it, God. I told you, plate it up. Well. You know, it only, it, only, it only takes one sin to be disobedient, right? Yes. God said, don't. And she did it. And oh, that's, that's no different than it was with Adam and Eve. God said, don't. And they did it. So nothing's new here. And it seems to me that people become so accustomed to sin that we live in a culture today that Somehow, maybe we really don't believe in the judgment. Look, I, maybe you came today for a feel-good message. I've been dealing with this one all week, so y'all can have a little bit of it. <laughs> it seems that people have gotten so accustomed to sin in our world that we have forgotten that what God says He's going to do, He's going to do. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. So what's the application for us? A in your outline is this. If you live with a divided heart, you're going to perish. That's what it says. 
The greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and with all your spirit. That's what it says. Well, a divided heart is a heart that only loves and serves God when they choose to. Only when it's on my terms. I can do real good on Sunday morning. But maybe not so good on Saturday night. And I tell you, that's not pleasing to God. The Word says that I've got to love God more than I love my money. i got to love God more than I love my job. i got to love God more than I love my wife. i got to love God more than I love my children. In fact, i got to love God more than I love me. And God will accept nothing less than that. Anything less than that is part-time love. Part-time Christianity equates into mediocrity or lukewarm. But what does the Bible say about lukewarmness? It will spit you. I like Eugene Peterson's way, but he will vomit you out of his mouth. So if you leave room in the corner of your heart for the things of this world, is what I'm reading out of this, then you open the door of possibility to live a life just like Lot did. Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah. How about this? How do you think you would do when this moment comes to you and God says, do not do that? At that moment, who would you follow? See, it gets personal here, doesn't it? It really is personal. The second application that I see in this scripture is this. You can avoid compromising your spiritual condition and principles. You can avoid that. You don't have to fall to that. You don't have to succumb to that. You know how you you know how you boil a frog? You don't you don't throw a frog into boiling hot water, do you? If you do, you will jump out. You put him in cool water. And you turn the heat up a little bit at a time. Next thing you know, you have pulled that frog and you never knew what hit you. That's how it is kind of, I think, in this, in this journey of ours. I don't know if anybody who set out with the intention to be an alcoholic, the intention to be a drug addict, I don't know of anybody who, who said, I want to be addicted to porn. I don't know anybody like that. They end up like that because they've been living like Lot lived. They pitched a tent too close to the sinners. When you pitch your tent that close to the city, things begin to rub off on you. You begin to listen to what they have to say, what the world has to say. And the world begins to confuse you. And remember who the prince of the world is. It's okay. You can get away like that. You're not near as bad as so and so. You can live like that. Don't worry about it. You got time to get things right. You just gotta get used to it after a little while. How many things have we gotten used to in our culture? Thought about that a lot this week. You know, again, I think about the first time I ever saw someone portrayed as a homosexual on TV. I thought, man, it shocked me. Now you see it. Every show's got something. I'm not picking on homosexuals. I'm just saying this is this is the truth. Remember the first time you saw nudity on the screen? Did it shock you? Does it still shock you? I doubt it. Do you, do you remember when certain curse words were said on TV? And you went, oh my goodness. Are you still as shocked? You see what one generation Sense, the next generation embraces. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening in our culture. Compromise happens very subtly. It doesn't, it doesn't happen all at once. There's not a sign that says, I'm going to try to sway you away from God. That's not how it works. It doesn't say, hey, I'm going to 
I'm going to make you lower your standards. There's no sign. In fact, compromising can be very appealing. Truth is. Again, I don't think when Lot pitched his tent outside the city of Sodom, I don't think he ever meant to move into town. I don't think he ever thought he would become one of the prominent people in that city, one of the power brokers. But that's what happened. He moved to the city and began to live in sin just like the rest of them. Let me just say this. One day, when we least expect it, the eastern sky is going to burst wide open. One day, that trumpet's going to sound when we Amen. least expect it. What a glorious day of it. It will be a glorious day. Yeah. But I don't want it to be today. I got too many people I know who don't know Jesus. I don't want it to be today. You get torn. But what's important is, are we ready? If it were to happen right now, as I'm speaking this sentence, would you be ready? Because the Word says very clearly that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then judgment. See, there was judgment in Noah's day. There was judgment in Lot's day. And let me tell you, there's going to come a big judgment day for us as well. I'm thankful for grace. But judgment is coming. I'm going to ask you, just, just bow your heads just for a moment. Stand up and, just, and bow your heads if you would. I don't know where everyone is this morning. It's not even important that I know. But I think it's times like this that we have to uh, be honest with ourselves. This much I've determined. You cannot live near sin without getting stained by it. You just can't. This message today was not to scare you. This message today was to challenge you. To make sure you're not pitching your tent too close to sin. And I wonder how it is with you this morning. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed. I wonder who might say, I probably have my tent closer than I need to be. That might be you get you to raise your hand, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Around the room, thank you. <coughs> the good news is today's a new day. The good news is you leave today, you leave today fresh and full of the Holy Spirit and empowered by Him. That all starts with confession and repentance. So if you're here this morning and you know that you're living too close to sin and you want to have victory over that, then you start by just telling God, I have. Dear Lord, just say that prayer, dear Lord, I have lived too close. I am living too close today. Choosing that. Put my tent back in the bag and move the other way. I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to live there. I'm going to live for you. And God is a God of grace who accepts that and loves that from us. Father, this morning you, you know. Give victory, Lord, to those today who have said, I'm going to, I'm going to start fresh today. I'm going to follow the King of Kings. 
I want to be obedient to the Lord, not to the world. I'm not going to be an enemy of God. I'm going to be an enemy of the world so that I can be a friend of God's. And so Lord, give victory today that not one would leave here feeling defeated, but we can leave here today knowing that You are with us, that You will not leave us, You will not forsake us. May it happen in Your name. You can be seated. Just one minute. I, I like what you got. You know, most of us know this song. I decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Can we sing that today as a, our testimony that we're going to follow Jesus? So you sit down and get back up. <laughs>